Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Melissa Perry from Wentworth, uh, Selborne Wentworth Chambers. Her presentation is entitled Intensive Factory Farming, Administrative Law Values and the Rule of Law. Dr. Perry. Thank you very much. It was in the early 1950s that Australia took its first steps away from small-scale farms towards corporatisation of animal production. This move began with the chicken meat or broiler industry in line with the model devised in the United States. Of this one commentator wrote in 2009 that almost overnight the Australian industry swiftly transformed from a system of backyard producers and family farms to intensely, highly mechanised commercial operations. More than 40 years later, three privately owned companies supply approximately 80% of the market and the number of chickens being produced has increased from 3 million to 470 million per year. A similar transformation has taken place, for example, with respect to Australia's pig meat industry, with the volume of pig meat produced in Australia having increased by 130% over the last 30 years, notwithstanding that 94% of pig farmers have left the industry over that time. <coughs> this expansion and change in production has been brought about by radical changes in the treatment of most animals bred for food or for products such as eggs, milk and hide, and the conditions in which they live. These include the mechanisation of aspects of feeding and slaughter, the close confinement of significant numbers of animals indoors, the uh, confinement of animals such as pigs and uh, in crates or cages for the duration of their lives, the inability of animals by reason of their living conditions to express their natural behaviours and the breeding of animals for particular characteristics, such as the speed of growth, which may result in endemic and significant health problems for the animals concerned. It came as somewhat of a surprise to me to realise that this transformation in animal farming practices and expansion in production did not prompt an overhaul of animal anti-cruelty legislation and the development of a legal and regulatory framework aimed specifically at the unique issues raised by industrialised animal farming. However, it remains the case that aside from the live export industry, which is regulated by the federal government, with which I won't deal today, the treatment of animals is governed primarily by a patchwork of differing state and territory animal welfare laws based on a framework <coughs> devised long before industrialised farming and applying to all domestic animals regardless of their circumstances. The principal development that has occurred since the industrialisation of animal farming has been the creation of detailed but generally unenforceable codes. The question I want to address today is how well that system stands up when measured against the fundamental values that define a society fortunate to be governed by the rule of law. The rule of law requires adherence to certain fundamental values. These include lawfulness, certainty and predictability of outcome, an effective and accountable administration and enforcement of laws. In short, as the Honourable Justice Spiegelman, ACQC, formerly Chief Justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court, has explained, the rule of law requires the administration of laws fairly, rationally, predictably, consistently and impartially. Added to this, the substantive content of law must accord with community standards and expectations. As the Honourable James Spiegelman has also said, the rule of law means much more than merely achieving rule by law. 
The field of animal anti-cruelty or welfare law, no less than any other area of human activity regulated by government, must meet these exacting standards. Indeed, the responsibility to ensure compliance with these standards is heightened where the capacity to inflict great pain and suffering upon sentient <coughs> beings is obvious and where the activities themselves are frequently conducted away from the public eye on private property, in closed sheds, in urban locations. In this regard, it is important to emphasise that the very existence of animal welfare laws recognises that the manner in which animals are treated and the conditions to which they are subjected are legitimate matters for public interest and concern. This is recognised in the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy, which in describing the strategy explains that it reflects the high regard Australians place on the value, care and the well-being of animals. To conduct a comprehensive analysis of the current state of animal anti-cruelty or welfare laws in Australia against these yardsticks would be a very substantial enterprise well beyond what could be achieved today. However, taking these core values as my yardstick, I propose to highlight a number of deficiencies in the current regime of animal anti-cruelty laws in Australia particularly in their application to the reality of industrialised farming in Australia, so as to illustrate what, in my view, is the pressing need for a root and branch reconsideration of the area. And I should say, in doing so, I approach it uh, primarily from the perspective of an administrative uh, and constitutional lawyer. Assessed against the value of lawfulness... The deficiency in the present system is to leave large areas unregulated by law, notwithstanding the vulnerability of animals in intensive farming situations. First, aside from Victoria, animal welfare legislation in Australia covers all domestic animals, irrespective of their circumstances, but modifies the standards applying to farm animals by exempting them from specific offences. For example, Section 9 of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of New South Wales makes it an offence for a person in charge of an animal which is confined to fail to provide the animal with adequate exercise. Stock animals, such as cattle, sheep, poultry and pigs, are, however, exempted. The treatment of farm animals is instead largely governed by codes of practice which are in general unenforceable, with the exception of South Australia. However, in most jurisdictions, compliance with a code is a defence to prosecution. These codes are usually based on model codes of practice developed by the Primary Industries Ministerial Council, although some jurisdictions have developed their own inconsistent codes. Significantly, these codes are not the product of transparent debate in the parliaments, and the community may have little or no effective involvement otherwise in the processes by which those standards are set. Secondly, the system's focus is up upon the pro proscription of cruelty, and this marks it as fundamentally reactive rather than proactive. For example, aside from Queensland and Tasmania, no positive duty of care is, is, is imposed with respect to the treatment of farm animals. Nor is there a state system of licensing requiring appropriate training and qualifications before a person may be placed in charge of many hundreds or thousands of animals. Nor does the current system promote consistency or certainty. A fragmented system of law is not a necessary outcome of federalism and makes little sense in relation to what is now a largely industrialised uh, industry, the major players of which are corporations conducting national operations. Notwithstanding such initiatives as the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy, there remains no uniformity between states 
and territories in animal welfare laws. Offences and defences are differently formulated. Some jurisdictions have offences of aggravated cruelty, but not others. There are variations in penalties and significantly also in powers of inspection. Added to this, offences of animal cruelty are frequently defined by reference to imprecise standings, standards, which require that a utilitarian balancing process be undertaken to determine whether the pain or suffering or distress inflicted was unreasonable or unnecessary. The difficulties in applying such provisions is not assisted by the fact that there is little authority on how that balancing test is to be undertaken. Even more concerning are defences of accepted animal husbandry practices, suggesting, as one commentator has pointed out, that practices that would be unlawful by reason of the pain and suffering that they inflict are exempt when carried out on a sufficiently widespread basis by the industry itself. Such standards risk entrenching institutionalised practices accepted within an industry as a yardstick for assessing reasonableness and rendering the industry effectively a judge in its own cause. Provisions in such terms raise very serious rule of law issues. Concerns as to the transparency, accountability and effectiveness in the administration and enforcement of laws are also raised by the existence of multiple potential regulators and bodies charged with enforcement, each with their own priorities and practices. These typically include officers of the state government departments with responsibility for primary industry, who thereby start from a position of conflict of interest, given their obligations both to promote animal welfare and to promote productivity. Others charged with investigation and enforcement include police officers and officers of charitable organisation, such as the RSPCA, with the latter in fact bearing the lion's share of enforcement substantially funded by private donations. There is no other area of law of which I can think where, regulation, where administration enforcement is largely left in the hands of a private charitable body. Rudimentary though the law in this field may be, as I have mentioned, the very existence of animal welfare laws recognises that the manner in which animals are treated are legitimate matters for public interest and concern. It also recognises that the law should accord with community values and with the standards that we as a modern developed nation expect. As such, it is already accepted that the classification of animals in our current legal system as property does not immunise their treatment from public scrutiny and concern, and that is a strong starting point on which to build. Nor is it radical to suggest that the law governing market practices should be amended so as to better reflect community values and expectations. For example, practices in the marketplace were radically transfer, transformed with the enactment of the, the trade practices legislation in the mid-1960s and in 1975. Underpinning these reforms was a rejection of the view that competition in a free market and the pursuit of profits could justify any means. The enactment of laws prohibiting discrimination on the grounds of race, sex or disability provide another example whereby values that were accepted by the community and were accepted internationally and that protected the rights of the vulnerable and the disadvantaged took preeminence over purely economic interests. Business has accepted and accommodated changes of this kind and I think it can fairly be said has benefited greatly from doing so as have all Australians. And to retract from those values and standards now is as unthinkable as no doubt it was once to enact them. These examples illustrate the important point 
that there is no necessary incompatibility between regulation of corporate decision making and industry practices so as to accord with international community values on the one hand and economic prosperity on the other hand. At the start of his Boyer Lectures on the Rule of Law, Chief Justice Gleeson, as he then was, drew upon the imagery in the play A Man for All Seasons, whose central character was Sir Thomas More. More as Lord Chancellor of England defied King Henry VIII and paid with his life for refusing to acknowledge the annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon and to take the oath of supremacy of the crown over the church. In explaining his actions in the play, Sir Thomas More refers to the laws of England as a shelter, saying, this country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, and if you cut them down, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? As Chief Justice Gleeson explained, the imagery of law as a windbreak carries an important idea. The law restrains and civilizes power. It is this which lies at the core of the rule of law. And it is this which must ultimately guide us in responding to the serious deficiencies that exist in a system whose sole purpose is to protect the vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, before we start for questions, shall I just check that um, Kathleen Plowman is here? Yeah, OK, good. OK, well, we've got uh, a little bit more time. Um, we've got about 10 or 12 minutes for questions. And there's a question over there. And who will be second off so that we can get a mic to them? Any other, for anybody else want a question? Well, if you do, just put your hand up whilst we're dealing with this one. Yes. Uh, it's a question to Melissa, if I may. Melissa, for as long as I've been attending forums <coughs> like this, um, debating uh, issues in animal law, people, speakers have um, lamented this situation where um, charitable bodies are left with the responsibility for um, <coughs> prosecuting criminal offences. And um, lots of lawyers say, this is just a crazy situation. But what has anybody ever done about it? I mean. Um, has the Law Council had something to say? I, uh, how, how have things gone on this long? Uh, I, I'm not, I, I must say I don't know the answer to that question. Um, speaking as, a, as I said, as a, an administrative lawyer, law lawyer, I, I find the situation quite astonishing. I, I, I've just never, I'm not aware, as I said, of any other situation in which it has arisen. Uh, and the pressing need for there to be change, I think, has come about in large part because we're dealing with a very big industry. So on the one hand, to have the body that is charged primarily with enforcement and inspection is the same, it, it is, in terms of its resources, very uh, much, uh, it, oh, I suppose, um, in, a, in a weaker position than the industry itself, which is quite huge. And I think in any event, uh, you should have an independent regulator which is adequately enforced. And that's an absolutely <coughs> central aspect of ensuring the rule of law in a society. And as I said at the beginning of my paper, this area, no less than any other area, should be held to the same standards. Any other questions? Yes, there's a question there. And then one over there. If we can get a microphone over to this side and one to the gentleman here. Uh, David Chamnus, DPI Victoria. Just a comment, not a question. Um, you spoke about the current codes of practice being voluntary, um, as has already been brought up through the morning. The, under the Animal Welfare Strategy and SCOPI, as the codes are being revised into standards, then they are enforce will be enforceable and the same standards will be national standards, so states won't have different ones. And that's the whole idea of the process, to get a national consistency um, and enforceable standards. I'm aware that there's a move in that direction. I'm not aware of exactly how well it's progressed. 
nor of the extent of community involvement in the, in the setting of those standards. So perhaps that's something, if I could throw a question back at you um, to elaborate on what you understand to be the position in that regard. There's probably others in the room could give a better answer, but certainly as far as consultation, there's in the development of the standards, there's industry, there's government, there's welfare organisations all in the reference groups and then a regulatory impact statement is done and a period of public consultation. So in the development of those standards before finalisation, there's certainly plenty of opportunity for public contribution to them. Um, where we're up to, the land transport standards are being adopted as we speak across the nation. Um, South Australia have already introduced theirs a couple of months ago. Victoria should have ours in before Christmas and New South Wales and Queensland um, early next year, if not this year, so that's underway. The, as was mentioned earlier, the cattle and sheep standards, um, Scopia hoping to have them completed by April next year. And the domestic poultry, um, Scopia have requested that that be revised starting, well, next year, the process should be going. Um, so things are underway, yeah. And can I ask you exactly how it is intended that those standards be in be directly enforceable and binding? Is it intended that there be amendments to legislation consistently across the jurisdictions in order to make that occur? The, the each state will be responsible for putting the, the standards into their regulations. Uh, most states will be putting it in their Animal Welfare Acts or Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Acts um, with penalty offences and penalty infringements, depending on the state legislation. In Victoria, we'll be putting it under our Livestock Management Act, um, which is enforceable, rather than we see it as livestock management issues rather than cruelty issues and allows for early intervention. So, yeah, across the board, all states will be working on very similar wording to get consistent outcomes with offences. States will have different ranges of offences, um, just depending on their legislation. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to grill you, but I, I, I know I've reversed... Yeah, make it, that's your last question, all right? <laughs> My last question. What's being done in terms of resources to enforce those standards? And is the enforcement going to be occurring by way of an independent regulatory body? They'll be enforced the same way as what most legislation is at the moment, so... Um, so those particular issues that I've identified about and have been identified by other speakers about the difficulties in enforcement, that they're not being addressed? Not under this current arrangement, no. no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Move over to is it Heather. Yes. Hi, Heather Neal from the RSPCA Australia and uh, this is more a comment than a question because uh, it's come up a few times today about the RSPCA's powers uh, under the various animal welfare acts ar across the country. I suppose from the RSPCA's perspective, these are responsibilities that, whilst are onerous and certainly funded by public donations, they are responsibilities that we are very keen to maintain, um, mostly because we believe we do them very well. Uh, we certainly understand that, particularly in a, a legal forum like this, that there is enforcement uh, pressures and, and I think many of the inspectors that are here today um, would tell you that there is much more work to do than there is resources available to do that. But I don't think that would mean that the RSPCA as an independent organisation um, doesn't have a role in enforcing that, that those laws because we've been doing it for a long time now too, I mean more than a century. So. Um, I think what we would like to see from an enforce enforcement perspective is state governments actually pulling their socks up and actually playing a much greater role. And I think, as Graham mentioned, if you look at uh, enforcement activities, um, be it actual compliance, enforcement, prosecution or education activities by state governments, uh, I think you'll see the RSPCA will come up and, and the Animal Welfare League, who I know are here today too, much higher than, than some of the states. So I think in terms of enforcement, my message would be um, the RSPCA is quite happy with what we do. We certainly need more support to do it, but we'd like to see state governments playing a greater role so that the legislation that we do have with all its foibles and, and faults is actually implemented much better for the benefit of animals. 
Can I just say, I, I clarify, I wasn't for one moment meaning to cast any aspersions oh, no, on I what I know is I knew a very that. good work, the <laughs> yeah. RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League. Issues of resources are very significant and there can be difficulties as well as where you have a number of different bodies involved in enforcement, even in just in, in simple terms of being able to get the figures about what levels of enforcement there are and whether there are consistent practices across the different bodies and so forth. Um, so, yes. Can, can I, I know I'm, I'm being very naughty here because I'm asking questions again of my questioner, but I, I meant to check before I came to the forum today, but is it the case that um, you have powers of enforcement here in New South Wales or inspection which enable you to go onto property without notice? I think or I'll pass on to one of the New South Wales inspectors. Dave. Sorry. So whether you can have sort of random surprise visits or whether in fact you need to get a search warrant or you need to get consent of the landholder. I know the position varies from state to state. In relation to land used for commercial purposes, um, there is the opportunity to um, access that land without warrant. Um, that changes somewhat when it comes to residential um, and private land holdings, but from the commercial purposes that's recognised as a, an animal trade and there's not the requirement to, to have a complaint. We can um, inspect to ensure compliance with codes of practice. And is that something that you find you, you, you're doing regularly? Um, we do do it. Um, regrettably, it comes down to a challenge of resources yeah. and um, the, the attending to the complaints um, occurs prior to the opportunity to do the, the proactive um, side of enforcement, unfortunately. Okay. Well, that's... The question was, does that include abattoirs as well? It, it applies to abattoirs as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a convenient point uh, in view of time uh, to uh, move on to our next speaker. But first, could we again extend our thanks to Dr Melissa Perry. Thank you.